you know, getting rich shouldn't be a goal. Getting rich is a byproduct of making good decisions. I love that. I actually saw a, a meme recently that said that uh, successful people don't have goals, they have strategies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Otto Gomes Crypto Show. I am your host, Otto Gomes. Today, we have a true crypto OG. His name is Vinny Lingam. You guys have probably heard of him if you've been in the space for anything more than a few months to a year. He is the original founder of Gift, G-Y-F-T. He's also one of the original founders of Civic, seed investor into Solana, Filecoin, Rendercoin. He's also the co-founder and CEO of his most recent startup called Weight Room. Vinny has some experience in the crypto space and has accumulated a mountain of knowledge and wisdom around the movements of the space as well as how communities are built and really has his finger on the pulse of the direction that the space is moving towards. So if you're interested in listening in and finding out more about his projects and the depths at which he has gone in the space, make sure you stay tuned to the end and listen in. Ladies and gentlemen, Vinny Lingam. Vinny Lingham, thank you so much for giving me your time, your energy for this interview. I really appreciate um, the, the work you're doing in the crypto space. So I let's get into it. I just want to know a little bit about your journey. Um, really try to go back you know, to the moment, that specific moment that you first heard about crypto and start there and like why it got you into the space. Sure. So I was, I was actually, uh, I was sitting with a friend of mine. And I was telling him about my business gift and we were struggling with credit card payments and, and, you know, chargebacks and fraud. And he was like, Hey, Bitcoin's doing really well. It's back up to 30. And I'm like, Bitcoin hmm, rings a bell. I think, I think I remember it, but I, I, I don't quite remember it. And, um, you know, it, like it was back in 2013. So I know I saw an article about it, but I'm like, okay, let me go check it out. So I, I started digging into this and I was like, this is interesting. And then I bumped into another friend who's like mining Bitcoin. And I was like, oh, you got some Bitcoin? He goes, yeah, I can sell you some. I said, like, great. So I bought some Bitcoin from him for like 40 bucks a piece. Uh, and that's back in the days, it was like, well, this is cheap. Um, you know, it was expensive, but cheap. It's like, you know, and um, anyway, so, you know, long story short, he, um, you know, he, he, he's one of the, the kind of the OGs of, of Bitcoin now because he was mining back in those days, as you can imagine. Yeah. But um, essentially, um, you know, we put Bitcoin into Gift, the com company is running at that point in time, and it took off and Gift became the sort of number one platform for, for Bitcoin back in 2013. It was uh, quite incredible, actually. Um, I, I was astounded at how much volume we did. But, but just keep in mind, back in those days, there, was, there were no real off ramps for Bitcoin. Um, I was just about to say, I was actually a big user of Gift. I probably gave you guys probably tens of thousands of dollars worth of, because I, I exactly that. I was trying to like spend my crypto and there was no way to do it. So I had to get these gift cards from you guys to be able yeah. to do that. Yeah, I, I bought a, I bought, I bought a, uh, I bought a gift for someone, uh, you know, which cost me about four Bitcoin back in those days. <laughs> Bitcoin was like 50 to hundred bucks for a while. So you're like, okay, well, this is going, you know, buy this. And then like, I look at the, if I go back to my purchase history, the amount of Bitcoins I spent in gift is insane. <laughs> oh yeah. I've, I've gone through those, uh, those moments before myself. <laughs> you get it. You get it. Anyway. So, um, so I, I you know, th that was the kind of the Genesis moment for me for figuring out, uh, Bitcoin. I got involved in the industry and started speaking at conferences, writing about Bitcoin. I got pretty involved in, you know, I guess what we're doing in the industry. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it's pretty exciting. So that that's kind of you know, from there to here right now. It's been a good nine years. Wow, nine years, man! It, lots, it's happened, been, lots happened in between. So much. It feels like it feels like decades of time yeah. has passed uh, being in the space. Things are moving so fast in the space. It's like time gets distorted. Almost, <laughs> you know, we say long run, and we're actually we actually mean four weeks <laughs> or or a couple months. But yeah, it's, um, this, week, this week's been the longest year in crypto ever. <laughs> <laughs> so true, dude. Honestly, like, what is going? 
I don't mean to pivot to current events immediately, but let's let's real quick just talk about what the heck is going on right now with this market. Is well, is- well there was there was already weakness in the market, and then Luna came along. <laughs> <laughs> Luna came along and just and just and just pushed it all over the edge. Yeah, exactly, and that's and that's the that, that's the, the truth of it. Uh, you know, ho- I mean, hopefully by the time anyone's listening to this, the markets are covered and we're on a better a better footing. But um, it's it's looking pretty bleak right now. Um, we need Bitcoin to go back above thirty thousand um, and stabilize there for a while. I, I'd love to see Bitcoin in the thirty two to thirty eight range for the next year. Just stable. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so you know, mo- most of my audience are fairly new into the crypto space. I'm I'm trying to be the bridge for a lot of the people that are trying to come in and understand what it is. So if you can mm-hmm. kind of, from your perspective, share your experience with the volatility and with these massive falls that that happen and what's happening now. Yeah, sure. So, so I mean, a large portion of this the, the problem is like liquidity crises. Um, you know, and and then you've got cascading. You know, like the entire ecosystem being built around. If you think about it, we have a lot of loans in the, in the ecosystem. So you have um, lending, DeFi, margin, margin, and collateralized loans. Um, and then you've got uh, you know a, a lot of leverage trading. <laughs> so what happens when when something like a Luna blows up? It basically um, it basically takes us to a point where we have a liquidity crisis, and then people get become four sellers. I mean, you get a margin call from your lender and they said, hey, if you don't put up the collateral, we're going to liquidate you. Uh, if you don't put up the collateral, you get liquidated. And when you get liquidated, it just dumps all these coins in the market and pushes the prices down. And so you, you kind of have this um, this thing happening over and over, uh, the repeating process. So, I, you know, I, I, I love that you mentioned this because one of the things I want to go a little bit into uh, theory a little bit here of crypto. Being in the space for as long as I have, I've noticed that the same bullshit is coming into the space from mm-hmm. that old system, from the old centralized system. The same, Absolutely. the same divisiveness, the same like taking from the many. Like somebody needs to lose for me to win. Even trading, honestly, I, I look at trading because the more I the more I look at blockchain, the more I understand it. The more I'm like, why do we have these freaking coins? Why do we even? mess with these coins. We don't need these coins. We need to create these blockchain systems and start using the systems, you know, to, to, to facilitate the transactions and literally step away from giving value to these little things. Um, so what is your perspective on that? I, I, I'm curious because it, it, I don't want to just create a blockchain based centralized system, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean that's the old school approach, um, and that's one which I I subscribed to until 2017, mm-hmm. and today I just don't think it's I don't think uh, I think there's just too many layers of obfuscation around what blockchain technology is. It's too much marketing, glitz, glamour, blah blah blah, and then we're at a point now where we're our own worst enemies. But the real question is, is this better than banking? And uh, in some ways, yes, it is. Now, there's no bailouts, which I like. So it's survival of the fittest. You know, Luna goes under, Luna goes under. We take the losses if we, you know, there's no insurance, there's no FDIC, none of that. Like, I'm, a, I'm not a big fan of protections. I'm a, I'm a fan of um, law enforcement. So when someone commits a crime, you go to jail, whatever. But I'm not a fan of like, hey, you can't invest in this company because you don't, you're not an accredited investor. I mean, that's crap. Um, I agree. Yeah, like, like you can go to Vegas. You can put all your, you can put a million bucks on black or red. The casino will take your money all day long, but you cannot ever invest in a company because you don't have a credit investor status. It's like it's kind of weird, right? Oh no, um, it's for me. It's intentional. It's super yeah. intentional to oh, keep absolutely. the poor poor and to keep the exactly. rich rich. Exactly. And so, you know, too much has been done in the U.S. and countries around the world in the name of protecting people. Protecting you from yourself has been the cornerstone of control. I love that you said this because I should tweet that out. You should just do it right now. I'm doing it right now. I'm doing it right now. Okay, (laughs) I'm doing literally right now. Do it. I'll wait. I'll wait. People from themselves has been the cornerstone of. I'd say like government. I'm on your Twitter here, by the way. I'm I'm waiting for it. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna repost it, or I'm gonna. Blaming on themselves being the cornerstone of government control. That, that, how did that sound? <laughs> Dude, I, I love that you said that. I love that you said that because, I mean, for me, the constant theme that we've had these last couple of years has been government overreach. It's been, uh, a, a daddy government, and like, oh, we're here to protect you. We want to, we want to keep you safe. So that's what it is. That's what it is. Like we are now in this moment of taking back, literally taking back responsibility of our finances. And again, I love that you said what you said. It's like, you, you know, why are we bailing each other out? Like, why is the government bailing this company out? Y'all messed up. Why? Exactly. why and it's exactly. even like, if it's even happening now with this whole Luna fiasco, you have like the lunatics saying, Hey, you guys going to help us out? Like we messed up. And they're even considering it. There's like a consideration by by the the Luna Foundation, and so I, that's a, that's a huge uh, ethical problem or discussion, at least in the space of like when is when do you con, when do you continually you know because there's like a thing about community support and like building community, but when is too much community start to become destructive? You know where where oh now we're just like this group of people helping each other out and, and, and just helping bailing each other out when we mess up. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's more about like, do you believe in capitalism or not? Right. If you believe in capitalism, then capitalism is something where you put money to work. And I, mean, I have a lot of long story discussions about capitalism and the histories of it and et cetera. But the bottom line is you, you have to put capital to, at risk, right? There is a risk. And then there's a risk reward ratio. And the problem is we have this like, mindset that oh you can put you should put the capital work but you know you, we should socialize the losses and privatize the profits and that's a problem that's not capitalism i don't know what that is that's not capitalism i agree and that's and that's something that's like been happening like we've there's been this distortion around capitalism where um and honestly i think it really goes back crypto kind of made this really easy for me to see but it goes back to the introduction of this third element this third party that had no value. As soon as you added, as soon as that, that was added into the mix where you can then create more of it to, to manipulate, that's when the, the few, the, the few people that understood the system could take from the many. Yeah. So, so I, I've always believed that, um, Bitcoin will be very successful when held by as many people as possible in small amounts. So, Historically, if you remember in like 2017, I was anti-ETF. I still am. I was, I'm kind of anti-micro strategies, you know, uh, even Tesla, like, you know, buying these corporate, all these corporates buying Bitcoin for the balance sheet. I, I'm like, this is a bad freaking idea. Luna, LFG, this is a bad idea. Oh, now we all see what happens when one party has too much Bitcoin and they're forced to sell it. So it opens up attack vectors. It opens up liquidity risks. It does a lot of things in the short term, which can harm uh, the growth of the cryptocurrency industry and Bitcoin by itself as a standalone. So I'm not a big fan of it, but we go through back to the scaling wars and discussion in 2017. And the reality is that we don't really have an option, right? Like we are where we are right now. So Bitcoin is going to have to scale uh, on layer two and lightning and whatever else. And so you're going to have this, this, this like centralizing factor where wealth gets concentrated because you can't, I mean, people can argue this point all day, but you can't really hold, um, like, look, Bitcoin is no longer um, what the original white paper was intended. I think most people will, will agree on that. It's, it's a store of value mechanism, which actually, does, it actually works to some extent. So I have a question for you because you just said that there's no other way, but maybe there is. Um, maybe. So I've, I've recently come to the conclusion that all these projects that are trying to launch at a global level are always inevitably going to fail. And here's why. When you launch things at a global level, you're opening yourself up, not just for the good people that are looking for, you know, looking for projects that are pushing things towards the right direction, but you're also going to attract the people that have just normalized that type of capitalism where you, oh, let's see where the gap is. Let's see where the faulty line is, where the hole is, and just siphon as much and just consume and siphon as much as we can. Um, so I've recently been saying, like, I, I really think that true decentralization is actually going to start at the local level, not at the global levels. Mm -hmm. Like where we'll have 
you know, you go into the US and you have a, a, a 10,000, 1,000 person projects. What do you think about that? Because honestly, the, the, more, I, the more I see these projects launching and, and getting bigger and getting bigger, all I'm seeing is the same thing that happened with the internet. The internet, when it started, it was like truly decentralized and it became centralized. It's what we're, you know, 30 years later, 40 years later, yeah. here we are centralized. Crypto started decentralized. What's happening? It's a decentralization again. So what's, what's to stop that from happening the same way? Nothing. And this is why I'm, I'm a big fan of multi, a multi-chain world. I don't think it's in anyone's best interest to have just Bitcoin or just Ethereum. Um, obviously, I back Solana um, and a couple others, but I think that you know, I'd like to see I'd like to see five to ten layer ones that each share up the market share. And you can have a leader, but it shouldn't be too big. And Bitcoin can be the number one market cap. It's totally fine. But a lot of the activity happens on Ethereum for NFTs, for smart contracts. Uh, Solana will be for finance or gaming or whatever. And as you go on the list, they you know, like Algorand's focusing on music right now. There's bought Napster. So I love the idea that we have this like multi-chain world and then there's bridges between them and no one chain controls everything and and we choose based upon specific use cases geolocation whatever we choose uh, the same with file storage you have filecoin you have arweave i think all this choice is good uh it's good to have optionality otherwise you have this concentrating factor which is a problem i love that i love that and that's and that's key right there i think uh i know you're talking a little bit more on a broader scale because i i'm i'm i can't help myself but i want to inspire individuals to just build their own stuff. <laughs> like I, I'm, I'm on that road. I'm like, nah, man, just do it yourself. Like fuck these guys, like just do it yourself. Um, but, but I think it kind of, it's the same flavor. It's just about, you know, the more diversity we get on layer one chains, layer, layer two projects, um, the better, because then we'll have choices. I, I think the issue is when you don't have choices when you have like a limitation of choices. Exactly. That's exactly right. So, um, yeah, I, I, I love this conversation because it's like, I know you really understand crypto. I, I, I rarely get people that really understand crypto to dive deeper into it. But um, so how do you see things moving forward then in the way that they are? Because I've recently seen a huge shift in, in how projects are being successful. I've seen that it went from, you know, oh, we got money. We got $5 million raised from this VC company. We got $10 million raised from this. VC, and now... And, and, and as, as successful as those projects were, now there's way more success in focusing on the community first, building that community out first, and then raising money from that. So how do you see, do you see that kind of continuing down that road or do you see it maybe evolving into something different? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it's a, I'm not sure. I'm not, I, I, I think that there's a really good argument for why we should do a, a community first uh, approach to things. Um, and yeah, I think there's some really great arguments for it, but I, I, in a lot of the cases, these things haven't figured out product market fit, which is the concern. Yeah, I went to the NFT. Were you at NFT LA by any chance? I was. Oh, I, I was there too. Um, and the, the, my biggest takeaway was like, oh, they're... They're, they're, you know, cause it was all about content creators and Hollywood coming into the space through NFTs, you know, Mark Cuban pushing that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm seeing this like massive it's happening. shift. It's happening. It's just not going to be very quick. Right, right. It's, it's, it just started, I would say, right? Like I would say that, that shift towards content creators, like NFTs took off, uh, low hanging fruit art, you know, the big main mainstream IPs came in and like, all right, well, here's, here's my art. Give me a $10 million. Uh, and now we started slowly seeing like, um, uh, regular content creators at smaller scales. <clears throat> and now they're like anybody content creator. We need content creators. We need content creators. So, um, I just, I just see the shift in the industry focusing now towards the people that have communities themselves that already have built in communities. And now they just need to incorporate web three into it. Um, so that's why I ask, cause I'm like, man, what would be the next step after that? Would it be to, yeah. to so if you figure out the product market fit situation and you know exactly what people are going to be doing, it's, we're still so early. Let's just be fair. But if, if you can figure out all these other things, um, this becomes, uh, the, the you know, and you have, the, if you have community, that's the easiest thing to solve. You're just like, you know, add water, there you go. Boom. Um, but I, I still think we're trying to figure out like stickiness in the games and, the pay-to-earn mechanics. And there's just so many things that just hasn't been, haven't been done yet. 
So let's talk about your projects. Cause I, I, I was going through your, um, <clears throat> your link tree and I saw that you have a few, you have a few projects that you've actually been a part of for a while now and that you started yourself. So you have gift, you have civic, right? <clears throat> the civic, which is, um, if you want to kind of describe really, really quick civic. Yeah. So, um, civic is a, a you know, it's effectively a, a decentralized identity platform. We're one of the first companies in the space to build that uh, back in, oh man, uh, 2015, we started the company. Yeah. So yeah, it was I a long, that. long time ago. I, yeah. remember, I remember you were the first one because I remember back then thinking like, oh, that's genius. <laughs> like yeah. this is the next thing. Um, yeah. Then you were the first ones. Um, and then you have this new project now called Weight Room. So, so yes. tell, me, tell me a little bit about Weight Room. I'm curious about that. So wait, wait, room, wait room is basically, um, it's a, it's effectively like what we do right now and on zoom, but with a twist, um, there's a queue of people lined up. And so when we're finished chatting or, you know, you're done with a guest, everyone gets to come in and have a quick, you know, either it's a Q and a, or they can have a, a conversation with you one-on-one, -on -one, but there's a timer and you can't change the timer. So after two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, whatever the timer is set for, they're out. And uh, it's 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 very cool in the sense that you have to, um, you know, you have to be very quick with, with your answers. You have to be very, um, you know, you, you you can't do you, you can't do anything uh, that will take five ten. I mean, you know, let's say you said five minutes as a timer. When your five minutes is up, it's up. Maybe you can. Yeah. You know, and if you're a celebrity, you have a lot of fans. You know. Uh, Oh, I, lo I like, like this. They, no, they, all get, they, they all get two minutes a piece or three minutes a piece. Where we try and keep the meetings under five minutes. We think five minutes is the max. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and yeah, so that's you know, that's what we're doing. <laughs> no, I think it's cool because like I, <clears throat> on Instagram, um, I have a few friends that on a weekly basis we do a show. Like we go, we do an IG live, and then we'll bring in uh, random people that are watching to to really quick ask a question. And then we will kind of talk with them a little bit, and then they go away. <laughs> Um, so I like this. It's actually really cool. It's actually something new. I feel like that's happening. You should use it. I'd, I'd love. I'd love for you to host a show on Waitrum. I would love to have you. Oh yeah, no, I was. Uh, that's why I'm asking you because I'm like I want to be a part of this. I was actually looking at it before we got on, and again, I love that you're you're making this. Is it is it crypto based? Like blockchain? Um, no, it, it, it's a bit. It, you know what I saw was the opportunity to build services on top of crypto. So we're going to be using Filecoin on the back end and IPFS and. We'll be using uh, NFTs, uh, but it's a consumer-facing service. It's not, you know, not crypto necessarily, but it's just a cool idea I had. I was like, you know, I, I want a system like this. I don't have time for all these, you know, long meetings and conversations. Let's do it quickly. I love it. I love it. Um, is there any specific crypto project you're you're like in right now? NFT project or DAO or anything that you're actually focused on right now? I would say focus on, but I'm I'm really excited about Moonbirds. Um, it's What's one it of called? my Moonbirds. Moonbirds. Tell yeah. me about Moonbirds. I actually did see that it got it like took off for a second, and then people were like, "What's a Moonbird? Why am I buying Moonbirds?" <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So Moonbirds, I, I think, really interesting. It's Kevin Rose who founded Dig and a whole bunch of other companies over the years. Uh, you know, it's his new project, and I think he's doing a pretty good job of it. It's the, you know, it's he created the Proof Collective, which is the, co the company which did Moonbirds, uh, and the Proof Collective is a, a group of of um, you know, art NFT slash art collectors, etc., uh, and then they created this PFP project called Moonbirds, and there's this cool mechanics like you can stake your Moonbirds, you can do, um, yeah, just it, it's pretty cool. I'm, yeah, I'm, was, I'm uh, very the project's uh, Proof X Y Z, right? Proof underscore X Y Z, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, I, I'm I'm curious about your perspective on that because like NFTs are great. I think they're amazing. I think they're, they're going to be used for a lot of different things other than just art and video and all that stuff that we're doing right now. Um, but what is your perspective on that? Um, I've, I've noticed that when I went to NFT LA, there was a lot of talk about bringing the NFT, like the bringing physical into the space, like marrying the digital with the physical. So do you see that kind of shifting in the space? Do you see projects looking at what, the person can practically do with the NFT in the real world? Yeah, that's basically where I think it's going. Um, I think that NFT is going to cross over to the real world soon. Um, it already has in many cases. Yeah, so, I was just, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I think we're there. I think we're there. 
Yeah, I was just talking to somebody about it because um, you know one of the biggest issues that I've I've seen is you know when you have a lot of money, you come in with a lot of money, you can kind of take control of that space. So would you would you I don't know if you if you've actually even thought of this. I have, but I'm curious on your perspective. Would you say that there is anything that that can be done to create a barrier of entry that is not just monetary monetary that's not just money? Um. It's you know, like sweat like, equity or something like that. You were saying earlier on, like community, right? So community is critical, and if you have a good community, then that makes that that is a moat around around whatever you're doing. So I would say community is a key part of it. So solidifying the community, making sure that you have the right type of people in there with the right mindset. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's more for like secondary market because in secondary market, uh, once you create the community and and it's and they're all there, like oh I'm done with this, I'm gonna go sell it. Then you're selling it to whoever. So I'm just looking at like how can we how can we create a barrier of entry for the for the life of that community so that no matter how much money you have you have to do some sort of sweat equity like you have to put in labor whatever that means to be able to then be a part of that ecosystem DAO whatever it is that they're doing yeah um, and, and I think this one I think Kevin and the guys are doing it with with Moonbirds really well they're creating this. I mean, if you look at the number of Moonbirds nested, it's like 9,200 or something. It's a, it's a pretty big number. Um, wow, this is great. I, I, again, I love this conversation. It's very, very, very uh, crypto friendly conversation that I get out. For me and my audience, we normally don't have just crypto conversations. Um, so let me pivot a little bit okay. and just talk about you. So you uh -oh. and your <laughs> um, just just a little bit about you and, and specifically how what you have as a vision for this space how do you see things moving forward and what do you want to see in the space like more of and less of um it's a tough question um look my vision for the space ultimately is can we get can we get to a world where you know there's the, I, look the long-term vision i'd say in 30 to 50 years is that we don't have borders anymore hmm. And people are just, you know, individuals and, you know, the, the, when I say don't have borders, yeah, you have borders, but, but it's not, you know, you can just move pretty freely between countries and the world's in a better place. I mean, do you realize that before World War One, we didn't have passports? I know. The, the more I learn about my own history, the more I'm like, what are we doing here? Like taxes, yeah. taxes started because of the war. Yeah. There was actually no. a fight because of not wanting to pay taxes because of war. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, and, and I think that a, a, a large part of what goes on in the world that, that is bad and malicious is a result of, um, you know, we have this like weird way of letting people who grew up in, you know, a very different era, uh, of, right now, like, this is be fair, like, po people who grew up in, I'd say, you know, like the, the boomer generation right now, they shouldn't be running this country. They, they, they really shouldn't. Like, I think everyone can agree that if you're like, 75 and above and you're like you, you have no idea what's going on you have no idea you're not you, you lived in a different world the world is not the same so for example like the fed what they're doing right now is they're thinking that they can apply like volker style mechanics on inflation in a much more hyper connected world and get a different result and and get the same result in terms of curbing inflation and they're going to screw it up i'll go on record saying the fed is going to screw this up and they already have they're, we're in a recession right now and because they just care about the labor numbers and the labor numbers look strong. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Yeah. It's like driving, it's driving, it's like driving in a car, looking at the rear view mirror the whole time. Like that's what they're doing. They're like, Oh yeah. Okay, you know, like we can just keep looking back and making sure that we're going to not hit a wall. Um, I, I so love that. I, I love that you said that. Okay. Oh, sorry. Keep going. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not like ageist, but I'm, you know, I'm 43 and I, I look forward. I'm like, okay, these guys have no idea what they're doing. I mean, I was, when I was 16, I was using the internet. So, it's I've been online for forever. I've been I educate myself online. I watch my YouTube videos. My I read stuff. I've had information my whole life growing up. These guys were like starved for information and knowledge when they were growing up. And I know what it was like in the eighties when the only place I get knowledge from was the library. So I, I I mean I was lucky that I was still reasonably young by the time the internet came along, and I had a whole world of new information and networks and connections and IRC chats and connectivity. And so I I feel a lot more plugged into society. Then these guys who sit in ivory towers, they, uh, I, they have no, I mean, look, we're, we're seeing the $30 trillion budget deficit. They don't care. 
Zero, zero care. Zero uh, fucks. <laughs> and it's funny. Uh, I just watched Jordan B. Peterson have a speech at Bitcoin Miami. And he said, uh, in other words, I'm not going to quote him here exactly, but basically said that we have people that are uh, uh, leading our country and creating new systems based on not what's happening right now, based on s- things that happened, like you just said, like 50 years ago, 60 years, like these, me- these, these mindsets and these ideologies from so far back when it's like, why are we creating systems to adjust to what's happening today in this moment? And it's, and it's like you said, it's like these, these people that are just, um, it's like the, it's like the, what they're familiar, you know, what, what feels familiar to them is different than what feels familiar to the younger generation. Yeah. That's the issue. Man, it's a, it's a a tough time to be alive right now. Um, with everything that's happening, um, you know, inflation and, and, uh, the lockdowns and there's just a big market, uh, now that the way it is, what, what should somebody be doing today? to protect themselves against what's happening because it seems to me like we're entering a time of like we're about to get hit hyperinflation but what's your perspective on it um honestly like i think that the the approach that the fed is taking to prevent it is um is probably gonna work but we're gonna you know so we'll probably beat inflation but we're probably gonna go into a massive recession so it's like, okay, okay, what's the point of that? <laughs> oh, I agree. I mean, somebody did a chart that showed the, um, where the housing bubble was and where the COVID bubble is. <laughs> it's like, oh, can you show, can you send it to me? Oh yeah. I'll send it. It's insane, dude. It's, uh, I'll even show it right here on the screen. Um, it's, uh, here, let me grab it. Look at that. How did you share that from your phone? From my phone, right? Yeah. It's uh, Zoom ha- has an option now to z- uh, to screen share. Oh, that's pretty cool. But do you see that oh, housing wow. bubble where it was and where we're at now with COVID? That's where we're at. We're all, we're all the way up here. Um, and that's not even the full chart. So um, so that's the first one. Then look at- you know, I mean, I don't think we're in a housing bubble as much as people think we are. I think housing prices are crazy, but telecommuting, what's happened, so what's happened differently is that wealth moved out of the, the, the city centers like San Francisco, Manhattan, and it got dispersed to areas like San Diego, for example. And that pushed the prices up above median income, like the, the median income, that distorted the chart, basically. So here's an example. I lived in the Bay Area, and it is really expensive there. When, when I moved down here, it was half the price per square foot in, you know, in, in a similar neighborhood to where I lived. And, uh, you know, I was like, wow, I can get all this value for my money and I moved down. And now the prices are equalized. The Bay Area hasn't gone up as much. Uh, a lot of people have left and moved down to San Diego. And now we're sitting with, um, you know, expensive homes in San Diego. But that's not because, that's because like embedded wealth moved and income moved from the Bay Area because of telecommuting, whatever else. So it's not a bubble. The housing market isn't a bubble. It's a restructuring of the American economy. It's basically a reallocation of capital from uh, densely populated areas to less populated areas. But now, so this is what the Fed, these guys don't get this shit. Like these guys are a bunch of morons. <laughs> um, but I agree with you, man. I, I, I've, I've been telling people that it, it feels like more like a redistribution of- Yeah, of the same guys who told us like four, five months ago, inflation will be transitory, really? And we were all looking at them going, you just printed trillions of dollars. You think this is going to be transitory? Good luck with that. <laughs> uh, I, the, the, the first time I heard about quantitative easing, I was like, that sounds made up. <laughs> uh, but yes, um, it's bananas. It's, it's actually Banana Republic. <clears throat> so I just have one last chart to show you and um, kind of get your perspective because I actually had this chart checked by a mathematician who is like intelligent in uh, um, like um, uh, um, uh, cryptography math, as well as fractal math, like fractal geometry math. So this guy, he looked at this and he was like, oh, no, it's real. This is it. So this is the chart. And essentially this chart is showing us a comparison or like a, a correlation between the inflation rate of fiat to the deflation rate of Bitcoin. Have you seen this? 
Um, oh, this is, isn't this a stock to flow model or something different? It's stock to flow model, okay. Uh, yeah, so this, uh, like, I mean, the math, the math equation is there is an exponential inverse hyperbolic tangent model that just shows um, the, the, again, the, the deflation rate of fiat or of Bitcoin to the inflation rate of, of dollars. And essentially, he came up with a date, and that's May 21st, 2029, is when there will be uh, it's this uh, dotted line here at the end where you won't be able to exchange any amount, like, you, can, you, you won't be able to exchange, exchange one Satoshi for billions of dollars. It'll be that, that worthless, the, the fiat. And so he said, this guy, this friend of mine, he said that in the next year and a half to two years, that's when we're going to, we're going to really start to feel and see the hyperinflation hit. Mm. So what are your thoughts? Um, I mean, it's it, like, I know, it, I know it, you have to check this. So like, I'm just, I'm just kind of throwing this at you. Yeah. Um, you know, let's I'm, say it's I'm, true. I'm doing, the, it's I'm, true. Doing, I'm doing all this math in my head right now, mentally. And, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, you know, it's plausible. It's absolutely plausible. I mean, the one thing I will say is there's a lot of reflex reflexivity in, in politics. And, and that really means that when things get really bad, like th that's a steady, this is probably a steady state projection, assuming that there's nothing that politicians can do to fix it or right. attack it. Yeah. That's and, like not, not changing anything and just going in the direction that we're going. Yeah, exactly. And you know, that's not how the world works. Things do change. And, and it's kind of like the, the other day, the earth stood still, uh, you watch the movie with Keanu Reeves. Yes. I never read the book. But at the end, it was like, you know, without being a spoiler, it's like, you know, mankind doesn't change and it's taken to the brink of extinction. I love it. I love it. And I, and I love that you're doing, you're saying this because um, there's, there's, there's a, definitely a drive, uh, you know, definitely in the, in the crypto community where, oh, we want to get people in, but, but they're doing it in a way of creating fear instead of going like, oh no, this is just like another path like we can take instead of this other path. So I, I, I'm glad you said that because at the end of the day, you can be afraid of everything that's happening moving forward and you can adjust to it, but that's just living in fear. That's just adjusting to the fear of something potentially happening instead of like, let's live in this moment. What's happening now? How can we move through this moment now? Correct. Well, Vinny, my brother, thank you so much for everything. Oh, no, uh, this is so, fine. Yeah. This I really appreciate you connecting. Um, <clears throat> if you have one, I like to leave the last word to the interviewee if you have something you want to plug or one last piece of advice or, or you know tip that you want to leave for everyone uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not the plugging type uh, uh although actually I, I probably should say i'm i'm doing a nft drop in probably in june called explorers explorers nft is the twitter handle and it's a free nft drop so you know go and get your free nft it's a hundred thousand high quality nfts um and we're doing, you know, effectively, I think a first in terms of the number of high quality images of these uh, ocean explorers free to the public um, in, on Solana. And so that's going to be, that's going to be really, really exciting for me. So, uh, you know, follow me on Twitter if you want to learn more about that stuff. And um, what else? Uh, yeah, and then, and then this, Sarah, I'll ask you this. If you're standing in front of 20 million people and you have a few sentences to say, only a few sentences, what would that be? Well, it depends what country they're from. <laughs> I think I, I think great uh, <laughs> if they're Ukrainians, I'd be like, guys, we feel for you, and we we really hope that uh, the situation resolves itself. Um, if they're Americans, it's like, well, I feel for you, and I hope the inflation situation resolves itself. <laughs> but you know, uh, to everyone who's you know who's in crypto or not in crypto. Regardless, I think you know whether it's whether, you know, we're all affected by the same financial system at the moment. Um, the, the the rates, the the market sentiment, it all flows from one from the financial markets to crypto markets back and forth. So keep keep a lid on your on your, on your mental health. Don't overextend yourself. Make sure you have enough runway. Make sure you have enough cash for living for expenses. Um, you know, getting rich shouldn't be a goal. We're getting rich is a byproduct of making good decisions. I love that. I actually saw a, a meme recently that said that uh, successful people don't have goals; they have strategies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's what it is, man. Just gotta, just gotta uh, step away from those those uh, expectations and really just focus on the on the everyday strategy. And uh, yeah, mental health that's that's key right now, 
especially right yep. now with the, with the market the way it is. So if you are listening to this and you are going through some some emotions, uh, honor them, but know that things will come back. Things will things will turn around. Um, this kind of stuff doesn't last. So yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much, Vinny. I really appreciate it, brother. And um, let's do this again. I, I really hey. enjoyed this conversation. Anytime, Otto. Take care. See you guys. You guys. All right. Peace. Bye. Yes. What an amazing conversation with Vinny. Even that moment where he tweeted out the tweet during our interview and I caught it on camera and tweeted about it. I love that. I love when things like that are serendip serendipitously happen. Uh, it just brings a lot of rawness and authenticity to these interviews. But wow, what a conversation. I mean, he has a great awareness towards the economy and the movements that are happening right now especially the swan event that happened with Luna and UST. It seems to me that his, his perspective is definitely on the right direction. You know, obviously this is just my own perspective of it, but it seems like he understands that it's community. It's community. You know, the projects that are built around communities that are community driven are probably going to be the ones to, you know, live out on the long run to actually survive these bear markets, especially the one that we're having right now. It's, it's a very emotional, very dark time in crypto right now, where we've had, uh, in the time of this recording, eight consecutive red candles, weekly red candles. And that hasn't happened since 2000, before 2014. I think 2014 was when we had six. And I think it was like way before that, that we had something longer. But, you know, in my opinion, with the amount of volume that has shot up uh, based on these red candles, based on the Swan event, it seems like we're, we've hit a, a, a turning point. And there's even like this correlation between the real world markets, like I say real world markets, like the stock exchange and commodities, commodities exchange, and just essentially, you know, that ecosystem is, is sort of matching this fall in the crypto space. And so there's something happening here. There's something that's about to shift. And I, again, I love the conversation that I just had with Vinny because he is aware of that. And, and, you know, honestly, being in the space for that long, I know why I, I can see why there's, there's a lot of patterns that happen in the space that once you start to tap into them and start to see what the patterns are, it becomes a little easier to navigate. So Again, if you enjoyed this interview and you want to hear more from crypto experts and people that have been in the space for a while and have that deeper knowledge, that deeper understanding of the space and the direction that it's going, and honestly, a benevolent one, one that's not just perpetuating the same old, centralized, tired systems, right? Something new. So if you enjoy this and you want more of it, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you let me know. Let me know through the comments. Let me know through the messages, through the DMs, through the emails, because that's the only way that I'll know how to provide the information that you want and shift it so that it fits um, the way that you receive information and the way that you become the most receptive to that new information. Okay. Love you guys. And always remember, gamify your buddy.